All right. Ready? Your next assignment is due on Sunday, and uh, on Sunday we're going to be down in the computer lab. We're going to get back to uh, working with Excel next week. So EB2-104 for our class on Sunday. Any questions about those two announcements? Homework? All right. I am going to give you a little bit of a suggestion on one of the homework problems uh, during today's class. And so if you've already got an early start on that, uh, you may have found one of, the one of the problems a little bit confusing. So we'll go over that. Um, so I also set out a copy of the project for today, and let's talk about the project. Um, and first we'll address a couple of concepts just to lay the groundwork for the main idea. Um, so let's consider this as a representation of a savings account. It, it's a tank of water, but the principles of accumulation and depletion apply equally to bank accounts as they do of uh, tanks of water. And that is that when you're considering something like this, a reservoir or a tank, the amount of stuff inside the reservoir is affected by what goes in and what goes out. And so um, let's consider that. <clears throat> uh, in your life, hopefully, you're going to have income, right? You're going to be working. That's the whole reason you're here at the university is to prepare yourself for a career where you can make some money. Uh, and so in this project, what I'm going to ask you to do is try to consider what sort of income are you going to make once you graduate and for 40 years after that. And so think about what factors may affect your income over time. Um, hopefully, you'll get promotions as you learn more. And uh, based on giving this project or a, a version of it last semester, um, it seems that salaries are a little bit low in the first year or two after you graduate. But then, after you've got some experience, the salary goes up a lot once you're a little bit more useful as an engineer to your employer. The pay goes up a lot. And so your income isn't going to be the same in 40 years as it is the first year that you graduate because you're going to be learning more. You might get a raise based on a promotion. So that's one part of it. But another part of why you'll make more money over time is that companies offer what's called a cost of living adjustment. You know, inflation makes the prices of things go up. And so if you didn't get more money over time, then you'd be able to buy less and less if your income was always the same. And so inflation doesn't directly cause salaries to rise, but it indirectly causes salaries to, to rise because uh, when the prices are going up in the marketplace, the employers have to pay their employees more in order to keep pace with the expenses. And so if one company isn't giving enough of a cost of living adjustment every year, then uh, they'll start to lose their good employees and they'll become less competitive. So in the project, you're going to do some background research related to income and you'll also be making some extrapolations into the future because you obviously can't go to the internet or do a Google search, how much money will I make 40 years from now? You're going to have to base that on some assumptions. So if we go back to this idea of a reservoir reflecting your assets, you know, this is how much money you have in the world. So the levels are going to be going down based on your expenses. And if you spend more than your income, then the levels will not accumulate. And what you need to do, because I, I think most people have as a goal that they'd like to retire someday, meaning that they want to live and enjoy life, go on vacation and trips, but not work during the last 15 or 20 years of their life or more. So that's retirement, right? During retirement, you need to have a big nest egg, as they call it. A nest egg means it's just that you've got a balance in your investment accounts that you can spend during the time that you have less income than expenses. So your regular expenses are going to draw down this balance, but there's also extraordinary expenses. Now, regular expenses are ordinary things like food, rent, the cost of transportation, communications. It's just the things that you spend on a daily and monthly basis. What would you suppose the extraordinary expenses are? A what? A wedding. Absolutely. Weddings here are expensive, right? Yeah. I've, I've heard that they can get a little bit fancy. Hundreds of guests, 
really expensive hotels. So you need to have a lot of money set aside for the wedding, or someone does, maybe not you, but someone has to have money set aside for the, expense, the expenses of a wedding. What are some other extraordinary expenses that are less common? They're not always happening, but maybe they'll happen one time in your life, or a few times, or during a period. Travel, Travel if you have a big vacation plan, good. What else? Buying a house, good. You want to have some set aside for a medical emergency? You can't count on those in the same way that you can count on, say, uh, your children going to university someday. That's a scary thought, right? Someday you're going to have kids and they're going to be spending your money so fast, just like you're spending your parents' money so fast right now, right? Yeah, there could be an earthquake, right? You want to be prepared for whatever comes along, all right? So, the main idea of the project is let's consider your assets and see how they grow over time. One of the nice things is that it's not just income versus expenses. There's also interest, compound interest. And so this money that is in this tank, you know, it's representing your savings account as a tank. Well, your account balance, you put it somewhere. If you put it under the mattress, then it is this simple because when you put money on the mattress, it doesn't grow. Or you can take that and you can put it into a savings account. You could invest in stocks. You might want to purchase real estate. So there's lots of places where you can put that money and then uh, magic happens where you receive an investment yield. And so that is interest on your savings or a profit rate. And so the level inside of the tank is going up as well because of uh, where you choose to invest your money. And so during this project, you're going to have to think a little bit about, do I want to put it in a savings account where the growth rate is 1%? Do I want to take a gamble and put it in a, uh, a high-risk stock that maybe in the past has grown for 10% per year? Or will you do some balance of a little bit of savings account, a little stocks, a little bonds, and so on? So you're going to have to learn more about those investment types and come up with an assumption of what your expected return rate is. And so once you've done this, you've gone through this research process, then what you're going to prepare is a report that explains your research. But the main thing I'm going to look at to begin with before I start reading your report is I'm going to look at a table that should be in your report. And what the table is showing is a summary of everything we've just talked about. This table is going to show for a certain year, what you expect your income to be, what you expect your expenses to be. And so your expenses, you're going to be able to figure those out by go to the grocery store and find out you know, how much do you need to spend on food. Um, look at the car that you hope to buy and think about if the bank buys that for me and I'm paying them back over time for five years, how much is it going to cost? To go to uh, Gulf News Classifieds and find an apartment. See what the apartment rent is every year. So add up all of your expenses. Then make some estimates about your 250,000 dirham wedding. Or maybe that's too low. I don't know. Or maybe your 75,000 dirham car purchase. Maybe that's too low. You know, you make your own assumptions and estimates based on the lifestyle you expect to have. And last semester I found some students, they want to be so Spartan and so frugal because they want to grow the nest egg. They're going to be sharing a flat with 10 people out in the desert because they want to save as much money as possible, right? And some people want to live in the marina and spend every penny that they earn. Um, so the amount you save every year is going to be the difference between income and expenses. And that's a simple operation, right? The amount that comes in minus the amount that goes out is how much that accumulation occurs during the year. But then there's also the magic that's happening inside the reactor where the, uh, the account balance is growing. So you notice in the first year you save 45,000 dirhams, but you don't get any interest the first year because it hasn't been a year yet. But then in subsequent years, you're earning a return on the total amount that's saved in your investments. And so that first year you save 45,000, and then this 2,475 is how much extra I would earn if I was assuming a return rate of 5.5%. 5 
And so the, this amount, if we go to the formula here, you can see it's the previous cumulative savings multiplied by my rate of return. So that's how much grows just based on what I've saved until then. And so this last column is important because it shows over time, if we were going to do a graph of your life, it would look like this. Here's time and here's amount of your savings. It will get big and then it will get small and then, you know, if you die young, you give some of the leftover money to your family. If you live a long time, it's possible that you might, you know, outlive your savings and then people have to support you. What I'm hoping for is I'm hoping to spend my last dollar on the day that I die. But that's just me personally, you know? I don't want to leave my kids anything. They can fend for themselves. All right? So that's the, uh, that's the project in a nutshell. Um, yes? That's a good question. So uh, she asked, do we assume a constant rate of return? And what most people do, like an investment planner, what they'd tell you is be aggressive and take risk when you're young. But then as you get older, you should be more conservative because as you get close to retirement, you can't afford the risk of having a sudden swing in the market. So maybe what you could do is for the first 20 years have one investment rate, for the next 20 years have another, or you could do it every, you could have a different interest rate for every year. You know, it's just, uh, it's really a matter of your preferences. And so this cumulative savings balance, let's look at the formula for that one. It's the previous year's balance, how much you had before, plus the amount that you saved this year and how much you earned based on last year's amount. Does that make conceptual sense to everyone? Like why is that why is the level in the tank going up? It's because of the difference between in and out, which is the savings amount, and then it's whatever return you're making on the balance itself. So inflation comes in because what you're going to need to do, that's a good question, thanks for asking it. Your salary is going up over time for the two reasons that we talked about. You're getting promotions, you're learning more, so you're getting a raise based on that, but then also you're getting a cost of living adjustment. So here what I did is I said, I hope my cost of living adjustment will be 3%. You probably can't see in the formula, but each year my salary in this just quick illustration is growing by 3%. And so cost of living increases, mirrors inflation, but then also you'll notice that my expenses are going up over time. Um, there could be a big jump in expenses if you have a child, but then there could be more gradual and periodic expense increases because of inflation. So you need to factor inflation into this manually. It's not like um, there would be necessarily a column like this that you'd use for inflation. I think what you should do is look at your salary and you can have it increase sometimes because of promotion, sometimes because of uh, inflation, and then the same thing with, with expenses. And you know, uh, expenses, food inflates at a different rate than clothing, um, so you can go to the Emirates Consumer in, uh, Price Index and find out the average inflation for the last few years and just assume that costs will increase in the future in the same way that they have in the past. Yes. Yeah, no one knows exactly what, I mean, there are projections of what it might be in the future, but those are generally based on what's happened in the past. All right. Good question. Other questions about the project? Well, I gave you a three-page handout, so I don't want to read it to you. That would be boring. It would lose my voice. It would be too long. So please read the whole thing because um, I gave this a, pr a similar project last year, but I've made some changes this year to try and um, make it both a little bit simpler to complete, but also I, uh, I addressed some problems that came up last semester. So I think these instructions are more clear. I put a lot of effort into writing them. So please don't come ask me questions about the project until you've read this. Because if you ask me something that 
is answered right here in the handout, then that would be a little bit, uh, you know. All right. So uh, let's see, what else to tell you about the project? Okay, so part of it is uh, group work, or can be, if you'd like, and part of it, most of it, is individual. So the, the stuff you can do with uh, collaborating with other students is the research aspect of finding out uh, what expenses and what income to anticipate. So um, if you, know, you and two friends want to call your cousins and find out how much they're getting paid as engineers, and then you can you know, come up with a scatter plot or something of, you know, I know one guy who's a chemical engineer in Alain and he's making a certain amount. And so if you want to pool your resources for the research, that's fine. But the report and the calculations should be unique to every student because everyone has a different lifestyle. Everyone has a different goals and plans in life. And so this project really is supposed to be about you. And uh, that's everyone's favorite subject, right, is, them, is themselves. So in a way, I hope that makes this project a little bit more interesting is that, you know, like, this is all about you. And what I hope to have you learn from this project is the value of saving when you're young. Because what you'll find out, when you've got this spreadsheet up and running, if you save nothing for the first few years, it has a huge impact at the end of the cash flow diagram. There's like no way to make up for it if you don't save when you're young uh, because of compounding. The money that you save early compounds so much compared to the money that you save late in your life that uh, you can really have a huge nest egg, as they say, when you're ready to retire if you're smart about things and save money early on. So I'm hoping that by making the spreadsheet and going through the project, you'll uh, learn that lesson. All right. so. Parting suggestion, read the handout, and then uh, if there are follow-up questions over the next few class periods, we can talk about it in class. Uh, what does the due date say on the handout there? April 17th. All right. So the nice thing about that is it's not at the end of the semester when all of your other projects are due and exams. And so let's get it done early. Spring break would be a good time to finish the project, and then you even have some time after the spring break. All right, so we're going to continue talking about um, annual worth analysis today. All right, so let me give you the handout for today's in-class exercise. Here's today's in-class exercise handout. We are going to look at two options. I've given you the cash flow diagram for one, but you need to create the cash flow diagram for the other. Find the annual worth of both alternative and let's find out which one is better. No, that's left over from last time. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so we're working on problem one. Here's option A. We are investing some money. And then we have costs over time, and then we have an ex, uh, a revenue at the end, that's the salvage value. And we want to find what is the annual worth of that compared to option B here. And here we say what option B is. It only lasts for five years instead of seven, has an initial cost, maintenance cost, salvage value. So find out which one is better. Now repeatability, I'm reminding you that you don't have to do the LCM for annual worth analysis. You can just find the annual worth for seven years for this one, find the annual worth over five years for the other one, and then compare them directly. That's acceptable when we do annual worth analysis. All right, so it tells you you have to do this one by annual worth analysis, which means do you want anything that's not already spread out over all the years. So here is something in the present. Here is something in the future. So take the future amount and spread it out over all of the A. And here is the present amount. Spread it out over all of the A. And the same thing you need to do with option B. 
Now we talked about in class last time that you don't have to make them the same number of years when you're doing an annual worth analysis because the repeatability assumption is built into an annual worth analysis. You already are assuming that you can repeat the cash flow and so you don't actually need to do that for the least common multiple number of years. We'll just pause a moment while you finish a few remaining calculations. All right. Well, let's talk about capital recovery. This is another thing that we uh, discussed during last class period as well. But um, let's talk about the main idea here again. So when you buy an item at year zero, you're going to dispose of it at the end of its useful life. And that's what's known as the salvage value. So the capital recovery is the difference between the two. Guys, I can't, I can't talk at the same time as you. You can keep working, but please be quiet. Um, so what we want to do in capital recovery is find out if we were going to pay for it over time instead of having one big expense and one big revenue, if we want things to be more even, what would be the equivalent annual cost that we have to recover? for the item. And the way that we apply something like this is finding out how much our revenue has to be each year to justify the purchase of a new equipment. So that's the idea that you're going to be doing in the next, uh, in problem two of the in-class exercise. So if you've already finished problem one, let's move on to problem two. Um, it said that you're going to purchase a truck for a delivery business. You know the initial cost is 120,000 dirhams. The truck has a life of nine years, and then you have some expenses for fuel, maintenance, driver salary, registration, and then in nine years, you're going to sell the truck for 24000 So you're trying to find out how much revenue you need to cover not only the capital recovery, but also the annual maintenance, salary, insurance, and registration. So how much revenue do you need to make everything balance out? So part A, just the good habit you should be in is always draw a cash flow diagram to help you visualize the problem. And then part B, find out the annual revenue that's required to, uh, to make everything balance out. Just one moment. Okay, the way this problem is phrased is basically how much money does your business have to make for everything to balance out? So uh, all that it's talking about at first is expenses with the exception of that one salvage value in the future. You've got a present value of 120000 because you're buying the equipment and then you've got the annual expense of 65000 which is the salary of your employee, all of the costs of operating the truck and then you sell the truck at the end after nine years. So you can see here on the cash flow diagram, I've drawn A equals question mark because we want to find out how much revenue do you need to collect every year to break even so that your business isn't losing money. And so the amount that I solve for is a positive amount. I need to make a positive revenue in order to cover the costs of the capital recovery costs and so the capital recovery amount was 16139 And then the 65000 is the maintenance and operation expenses. So in the end, that's the revenue, the 78871 All right. So that leads us to this hint I'm going to give you on the homework. Yep. So what's the problem? This is, this is the annual amount. This isn't a one time. This is the A, right? So what I'm saying is you need to make that amount every year to cover the cost of the business. 
Okay, so you have this problem for the homework that's due on Sunday. And the way that they describe the situation is a little bit unclear, so I wanted to uh, help you go through and interpret this problem. Basically, what it is is someone's getting money and they're going to buy a piece of real estate with it that they want to have income for 20 years and then they sell the real estate at the end. So the cash flow diagram looks very similar to what we've been looking at just now. There's an initial expense in year zero, there's revenue in years one through 20, and then there is the sale at the end. So all that information is described here. What it's asking is how much revenue do you have to make for everything to balance out? In part A, there is the 500,000 here, and they say that in the end you're selling it for 90% of 500,000. And so how much revenue is required every year for 20 years in order to uh, account for the capital recovery. So the difference between the purchase price and the sales price. And it says here that this person wants to make 8% per year. So part A is relatively easy. Where things get tricky is in part B. Because in part B it says, what if this person, instead of holding it for 20 years, what if they sell it after 10 years instead? And um, so what it's saying is, you know, you found an amount in part A. You found some certain amount. Let's say that now that's a known. So the amount that you found in part A, keep it going. So keep it going for 10 years. And then how much do you have to sell the condo for so that you're making the 8% that you want and you have only 10 years of this revenue amount? So the A continues for 10 years, then you've got this future sale in 10 years. So again, you find a capital recovery amount in Part A, and what I'm telling you is in Part B, use that same capital recovery amount that you solved in Part A. But the cash flow diagram only goes for 10 years. She still buys the condo for 500,000 in year zero. She gets this income that you solved for in Part A, and the unknown is how much to sell the condo for in year 10 in order to receive 8% interest. So the unknown becomes the F in Part B of the problem. So if you don't remember or don't understand yet, you know, I'm sure at some point you'll start working on this problem and you can come back to the description in the video and hopefully that'll help you out a little bit. Here's the last thing that we are going to talk about today. We weren't going to finish early. Did somebody think we were going to finish early? No, not today. All right. All right, what we've talked about uh, previously ties into the idea of what if something lasts forever? Um, there are some things, infrastructure projects, that when we build them, we build them big enough that they last for a really, really long time. Maybe not well enough and big enough to last forever, but when we're talking about 100 years or 200 years, because future worths are so small compared to present worths, uh, it's essentially infinite if you're working them beyond 100 years. So a bridge, a dam, canals, those sorts of things are, are uh, constructed with very long lifespans. And what we know is that you can find the capital recovery of an item by multiplying its initial construction cost by the interest rate that you have to uh, be working with. And so you can find the capital recovery cost for a bridge, for example. If you know how much you're going to pay to build a bridge, then if you want to annualize that one-time cost, you simply multiply the present amount by the interest rate, and that tells you the A if the item lasts forever. So how does this differ from what we've been looking at so far? You'll notice there's no salvage va value. You're not selling the item at the end if it lasts forever. You're just trying to find out what's the annual equivalent of the first cost of something that lasts forever. So now on part three, on the back of the paper there, I'd like you to consider uh, someone who's building a bridge in order to get toll revenue. Part A is easy. You just use this formula that I showed you. A equals P times I. But then in part B, I'd like you to compare that amount to the estimated revenue and see if it's a good idea building this bridge, if the bridge should be built or not.
Okay, so I don't know who has enough money to build their own bridge, but apparently in this problem, somebody out there does. They're going to build a bridge, and then they get to keep the revenue. They're charging people to go across their bridge. So uh, if you pay $55 million to build the bridge, and you want a yield of 6.75%, that means you should have a revenue of $3.7 million every year in order to cover that. So that's the capital recovery if the item lasts forever. So what we're saying in Part B is let's look at reality. If people are only willing to pay $525 to cross the bridge and you expect 500,000 vehicles per year, then how much money do you actually get? So if you add up all the crossings and the revenue per crossing, so that's $2.6 million per year. So we can already see that it's not looking good because the revenue is not going to match the capital recovery. And if we express that as an interest rate, so here's the revenue, the 2.6 million, and our present value was 55 million, that works out to a return on investment of 4.77%. So even if this person is getting revenue forever, uh, assuming that the 525 stays the same, assuming that forever they don't raise the price of the crossing, the net yield is only 4.77%. And so, if they're insisting on getting 6.75, then they shouldn't do the project. All right, that's all the time we have for today. There's a few people who still didn't pick up their exams. You can grab that on the table up front. I'll see you down in the computer lab on Sunday.